Roxford Park Community Church and Wallen Gateway Church have been in a special missional partnership for more than six years in Melbourne's Northern Corridor. Taking the gospel of Christ to as many in our community as we can. While the COVID-19 restrictions are in place, we're collaborating once again to bring worship into as many homes as we can. We hope you'll be encouraged by today's online service.
God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. I am a child of God. 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 See what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. Sing, I'm no longer.
glory fill this house. Now the world awaits your presence, and this power is. Fill this house, pour it out. 
Church, I hope you're enjoying this morning's service. I know I am. Before we get started with the sermon, I just wanted to take a moment to let you know that we have a dedicated prayer service available for you every week after the service. We have two teams on standby, one from Wallen Gateway and one from Roxburgh Park Community Church, waiting to receive your requests for prayer. The process of putting through a request is quite simple. We'll provide the details on your screen at the end of the service after the sermon, so make sure you stick around to see them. You can ask for prayer by email, prayer by phone call, or you can just ask for us to be praying for you as a team. We're eager to pray for you as we love our church family, and often it's important to respond to the sermon and uh, come forward for prayer. We know this is an important part of your walk with the Lord. So don't hold back. Make sure you get in touch with us at the end of the service. For now, grab your Bible and a notebook and let's get ready to hear the sermon. Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you. Uh, Whether you're listening from Bendigo or Seymour, hello, Parker and Nerida this morning, uh, or Sunbury or Doreen or Eltham or everything in between. Uh, We welcome you today. And we pray that you'll be blessed. I've already been blessed out of the worship. I'm lucky to be here uh, in the atmosphere that's been created by Holy Spirit and uh, been blessed already. And I hope that uh, much of that has come through to you, uh, through your screens and and devices this morning. God can do anything. He can do absolutely anything at all. I want to pray. We're looking at our uh, final session, I think, anyway, uh, of uh, or a ser- in the series uh, An Open Heaven. And... Uh, this has been boiling in me for the last few weeks and I, I hope that I'm able to, I pray that I'm able to do what God wants me to do this morning. Or you pray with me, pray for me this morning. Father, it's my heart to say, to express, to articulate as you want the message you've laid in my heart these last few days in particular. And it will be let loose with all the authority and power of heaven. First of all, Lord, to bring glory to you, to then to bless your people on this earth who you have left here for a great purpose. Lord, help us to grab a hold of what you would say to us today. Take this to heart and let today, Lord, be a, a turning point in the lives of hundreds of people, we pray. Lord, may the meditation of my heart the words of my lips be acceptable to you today i pray in jesus name amen well as i said these last few weeks we've been uh, exploring the reality that every person born again uh, lives and breathes under an open heaven and we've discovered what that means um it's as if we live as us uh, as born agains in a completely new dimension where in this whole new created order that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, there's a whole bunch of new rules, supernatural rules, the rules of God that just come into play for the children of God who live under that open heaven experience. Uh, and the Bible emphasizes this time and again, but we don't see it. We, we've actually been educated in some ways not to see these things in Scripture. And I feel lately that my mission is to try and bring enlightenment and, and, and show up these Scriptures that speak about these kinds of things. Um, and so living under this hope in heaven doesn't entitle us to do whatever we want, whenever we want. That, that's just silly. Uh, of course not. The open heaven is for one purpose, as Jesus said. Look at this in John chapter 14. <clears throat> Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father, you may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. You want to help Jesus bring glory to the Father? Do what Jesus asks you to do. Real simple. Whole sermon right there. <laughs> we won't do that one today. <laughs> Even greater things than these. Uh, things Jesus had been doing right in front of the disciples all that time. And the critical piece here, of course, is that Jesus said, is is, is faith. Having faith in Jesus is the open door for us to do what Jesus did and much more than that. Uh, And faith, to make the point, 
is much more than just believing that Jesus exists. Satan believes that Jesus exists. He's not born again, which is why he doesn't know the mind of God. Anyway, that's another story. That's another sermon for another time again. <clears throat> no, no, faith is expressed in obedience to Jesus Christ. That's first and foremost. This open heaven access is there for all of us born again, all of us believers. It's absolutely available to all Christians, no exceptions. But the effective access to it, the, the, the realisation of that, the actualization of that, the appropriation of that into our daily lives and in the ministry, it depends on a few things. And faith is number one. Faith is critically important. And as I said, it's much more than just believing that Jesus exists. It's believing, not even believing the way we think is acceptable to Jesus. It's faith that obeys the commands of Jesus Christ without question. It is faith that abides in him, in this close, deep communion, so that we learn his heart, we learn Christ. And that's a series of messages I want to speak soon about learning Christ in the school with Jesus. And, and, and greater things than he did, we will do in his name. Uh, for the glory of the Father, for the undoing of the devil's work on this earth. I mean, <laughs> what greater privilege is there? I mean, a privilege, sadly, unused by so many Christians today. Why? <laughs> well, last week we looked at two key reasons why born again can't seem to or don't want to access this open heaven that, that's over us. And both reasons have to do with a failure to understand our identity as human beings created in the image of a holy God. The image of God on us, whether we're born again or not, doesn't make any difference whether you're born again or not born again, the image of God is on you. This sets us apart from every other creature on the planet. We were given the image of God for several reasons. This gift was given for several reasons and if you want to know more about that, look at last week's message. If you want the notes, I'll send you the notes. But first, it's so that we have sacred identity and could have intimate relationship with the Heavenly Father. That's the first thing. And from that, from all of that flows divine function. And it just flows with ease. It should. With the fall into sin, you need to understand this, with our fall into sin, we never lost our identity. Our identity was never lost. The functionality of our identity, well, that was seriously impaired. That was lost. Now, we never lost our image, image of God on us. Now, if that was not true, why, God would never have bothered to engineer a plan of salvation because it wouldn't have mattered. But see, the image of God does matter to him. It does matter to him how valuable is the image of god in us i'll tell you how valuable it is it's at the very least worth the blood of your son the image of god is about his glory and this is exactly why the apostle paul wrote this have a look at this in second corinthians he says this now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is present there is freedom i mean that's a reference right there to open heaven by the way we'll look at that another time and we all with unveiled faces reflecting the glory of the lord are being this is a constant process transformed into the, the same image from one degree of glory to another do you see that from into the same image from one degree of glory to another degree of glory which is from the lord anyway who is the spirit now note that phrase there from one degree of glory into another that's important that is a direct reference to the image of god in us and as born again whose sins have been atoned for that image is being restored to full glory and proper functionality that's exactly what paul is talking about here and this is through the ongoing work of sanctification as the holy spirit works the work of the cross in us every day we're changed from glory into ever-increasing glory. And with the glory, this is really important, with the glory comes functionality. With the glory comes functionality. 
and I'll speak of that another time as well. There's a whole series of messages there that have been bubbling up in my heart. The two reasons I mentioned last week that prevent us from accessing an open heaven are these. One, so many of us settle for a fire insurance policy understanding of our salvation. That's a complete waste. Our salvation is our eternity protection plan. <laughs> That's it. In the meantime, I'm not interested in the will of God for me. I'm not interested in the will of God at all. In fact, I'm here to have a good time, and when I die, I'll go to heaven. That's me. Well, I want you to remember the words of Jesus right here in Matthew 7, verse 21. Have a look at this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's not just when you die. That's about entering the open heaven aspect of the kingdom as well. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What's the will of the Father? Well, as I said last week, it's not a fire insurance policy. That is not a fire insurance policy is not your identity as a child of God. The glory of God, that's your identity. Jesus didn't die and rise again so we could have just a fire insurance policy and that's it. There's much more going on here. Now born again, we have been transformed through sanctification. That's the purifying work of Holy Spirit in us who applies every day the work of the power of the cross to deal with any dysfunctionality that would be smirched, that would hinder the glory of God, the image of God on us. That's what he does. And so, <clears throat> and so, that, so that we can function as God intended. And that's for his glory. That is the reason for salvation. Believers simply have to understand this and cooperate with the Father, cooperate with Holy Spirit and not waste their salvation. We will give an account for our salvation, for how we've stewarded that. How many parables speak about this? The parable of the talents is a key one. The second reason we don't or, or cannot access this open heaven under which we live is because we struggle to believe we were worth God's Effort in the work of the cross. In simple terms, one word, that's unbelief. That's sin right there. And we struggle to believe that our shame and guilt has been permanently dealt with on the cross by the blood of the Lamb. And so we keep feeling unworthy all the time when we should be changed from glory into glory ever increasing. You know, I, I, I was chatting, I, I call that, I've called that for years worm theology. I'm a useless, worthless, little, hopeless, little, wormy uh, person, this unworthy person. I'm a loser. I'm pathetic. But, well, and you know what? That's not the enemy doing that to you. That's you doing that to you. And it disqualifies you. It stops you from operating under an open heaven when you do that. Now, that's unbelief. And unbelief empties the cross of its power in your religious system somewhere. I so say, stop. Stop it. Live by faith, not feelings. So now that we know all that stuff in the last three sermons, what's stopping us now doing the things that Jesus did? And even greater things than that, for the glory of the Father. Now, now that we own our salvation as way more than fire insurance and we own our identity as children of God most high being transformed each day from glory into ever increasing glory what could stop us now I mean what could stop us now because the apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2 look at this just as it is written things that no eye has seen or ear heard, or mind imagined are the things God has prepared for those who love him. What could stop us now? No eye has seen, no ear heard, no mind imagined, could possibly dream of what God has prepared for those who love him. Now you add that statement to the other statements we've collected along the way in this series, that God is no respecter of persons, there's no elite in God, no spiritual elite in God, we're all entitled to the same open heaven experience. God is no respecter of person, and Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means that we have access 
not only to everything God's ever done in the past, and that's pretty awesome stuff, a lot of that, but access to all the things he's prepared in advance for those who love him. That's enormous range potential for the people of God, the children of God on this planet. What can stop us now <laughs> with all that? What can... Let me tell you about Jacob. In the ancient Genesis account, chapter 27, we see Jacob steal his older brother, twin brother's birthright blessing. His mother puts him up to it. But Joseph, uh, Jacob willingly goes along with the plan to deceive Esau and Isaac. And you know the story. He receives it by cheating his brother, deceiving his father Isaac, and he receives that blessing. He acquired it by deceit, by cunning guile. And that's a powerful blessing he got. It was incredibly powerful. You read the story in, in Genesis 27. And of course, Esau comes home and learns what's happened. He's breathing murderous threats. He's going to kill his brother. And so Jacob just disappears. He just heads for Uncle Laban's uh, property, his uh, mother's brother, uh, in some far off place before he gets killed. And on the way, he stops to sleep somewhere in Whoop Whoop, <laughs> we don't know where, and lays his head down on a rock for a pillow. And he falls asleep and he has a dream. And here's how it all unfolded. Have a look at this in Genesis 28. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. I think that's where the saying between a rock and a hard place. No, anyway, and he, he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth the top of it reaching the, to heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring should be like the dust of the earth. And you shall, you shall sit, spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob, Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it, had no idea. And he was afraid and said, How Awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. I mean, think about that, what he just said. And so Jacob rose early in the morning. He took the stone that he had put his head on and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on it. He called that place Bethel, which means house of God or place of God. Jacob knows that he has seen a momentous thing in this vision this dream. He hears the voice of God. He sees God speaking to him. And he realizes it has something to do with the blessing he received from his father Isaac, the blessing of the firstborn, which is in, the, and I'll go into all the covenantal stuff another time. But he doesn't, he doesn't exactly know what's going on. He says, how awesome is this place? Um, something awesome is happening this is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Um, he's got no idea. Jacob sees a very great truth. And as great as it was, he sees it very briefly. But right there and then, he's not able to enter into that truth. He's not able to enter into that place with God, into the reality of it. Jacob could not have entered into the meaning of what he saw. Specifically, uh, the place where heaven and earth meet. The place where God and man, God and woman meet. This on earth as it is in heaven kind of place and moment where the glory that unites heaven and earth, God and man, is the great link between earth and heaven. 
where the glory that unites heaven and earth uh, is realized, where God speaks and makes himself known so clearly, where his purposes are so clear, his ways are revealed to us, the, where the anointing comes. Jacob couldn't enter into any of that reality. Why? Why couldn't he do that? Because he was in deceit. He was in deceit. He has to leave that place and labor for 20 years coming under the discipline of God. He learns how to do it, read the story, learning to obey God, learning to trust God, to develop an obedient heart. And 20 years later, at the end of 20 years of discipline, he encounters the impact of heaven upon his earthly life, the impact of the Spirit of God upon his flesh even, the impact of God upon his person. And that happened on his way back to Canaan to see his father. And when he gets to the Jabbok tributary, uh, a stream flowing into the Jordan River, he'd left his uncle's employ, and now with family and flocks and herds and camels and servants and kids, he's headed home to, to Canaan. And he's a bit anxious about meeting Esau, even after 20 years. So he sends them all across the ford at the Jabbok stream, all the servants, all the family, and he alone remains on this side. And that night he wrestles with God. It went on all night, that wrestling match. Exactly what that looked like, what that felt like, we're not exactly told. We're given only the briefest detail in the Genesis narrative. But in all of that ref wrestling, Jacob refuses to let go. And the angel of the Lord finally has to deal a hard blow to his flesh, dislocating his hip, the mark of which he wears for the rest of his life. He limped for the rest of his life. So, but even though in pain after that, Jacob refuses to let go until he receives a blessing. He gets the blessing. Look at what it says here in Genesis 32. Then the man said, let me go, for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Oh, I could preach sermons about prayer right there. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and humans and have prevailed. Now, this is a picture of the flesh life, broken, struck by God, and withering more and more, and the spirit life rising up in the recovered, God-given identity. In that wrestle of persistent faith, where Jacob refuses to let go until he has the blessing, the old Jacob is struck down and Israel emerges. New identity is given for the purposes of God as the deceit and the guile are finally dealt with. Jacob's judged. Jacob is struck. The flesh begins to wither and weaken, and now he's ready for Bethel to properly abide with God under an open heaven. The deceit, the flesh life, have been dealt with. It's no longer Jacob but Israel, in whom there is no deceit. The work, of course, is not finished, but the breakthrough for Jacob had come. Twenty years before, Jacob had briefly experienced the glory of an open heaven, an awesome, magnificent, glorious thing. He glimpsed it. He didn't know how to handle it. He, he, didn't, uh, he couldn't access it. He didn't even understand it properly. <clears throat> but through the discipline of the Lord, he comes to this moment in his faith journey. Through the discipline of the Lord, he comes to this place where the old was struck away by God and starts to wither. The flesh life is dealt a withering blow and the spirit life takes form and starts to function. More than 20 centuries later, nearly 21 centuries later, Jesus meets Nathaniel, one who'd become part of the original 12 apostles. 
And this is what happened. Look at it in John chapter 1. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph of Nazareth. Nathanael said, Oh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw, listen to this, when Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you know me? Jesus said to him, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called on you. Nathanael <clears throat> replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I had this little prophetic word about you under the fig tree, Nathanael? You'll see greater things than this. And he said to him, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened, the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of of man. Twenty centuries later, after this Jacob experience, he confirms, Jesus confirms, how we access the open heaven under which we live and breathe. I want you to listen carefully to what the Spirit of God is saying to your heart this morning with these two open heaven mentions, one in Genesis, one in the the Gospel of John. Listen to what the Spirit is saying to you right now. In a word, it's this. To properly come into the place of the open heaven, which is not geographical, to come into that place where for you God's coming down to you in communication and revelation and anointing on your life, where his glory lingers and where you enjoy what Bethel means, is nothing else but coming into an abiding with Jesus. And to come into Jesus and abide in him, that is Bethel. That's the house of God. And to come to Jesus and abide with him is to, to enjoy all that we can possibly enjoy and do all that we could possibly ever do under an open heaven. As God reveals stuff to you and parts stuff to you and your family, uh, and you, it means you've come into this place where the natural life, the flesh life, the deceit of the flesh is dealt a withering blow by Holy Spirit, applying the work of the cross. Friends, you can be forgiven for your sins every day and God will forgive you. But the self-life can remain. It must wither and die. It's that simple. The, the, the flesh life, the deceit of the flesh life ruled by sin has to die. And Jesus needs to be able to say to me and to you as he looks at us, Behold, a born again in whom there is no deceit. Heaven will be opened to you. You will see heaven opened. I mean, <laughs> to speak of the Jacob life is really to speak of the self life. The, the flesh life is the self life. I mean, the reason why Jacob stole the book, it was about him. It was all about him. It wasn't about God. And, and this self is the, the self is the very essence of the deceitful life. In fact, the, the, the prophet Jeremiah mentions this. He says in Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things. It's beyond cure. Who can understand it? He's not talking here about the heart of a person whose intention is to do evil all the time, uh, but the self-life in its entirety. See, Jacob uh, is in the elect line of Abraham himself. He had knowledge of God historically, theoretically, and by inheritance, but the transition from the natural man to the spiritual man came through discipline and crisis where choices had to be made to go his own way or to go God's way with blessing. He had to own his faith for himself and mature in that. The self-life, let me, folks, let me be really clear here. The self-life is not something that is manifestly or overtly evil like murder or witchcraft or something like that. It's part of the sin condition 
that will still affect us if we're not careful and we don't allow the Holy Spirit to apply the work of the cross in us every day to every part of our being. There are many things. Let me tell you, there are many things done for God with apparently the purest, the noblest of motives, innovations, thoughts, magnificent creativity as done out of ourselves has nothing to do with God. That is self-life stuff right there. They, uh, they come from me, and they are very different, very, very different to what God's thinking. Folks, I, I, I cannot access open heaven with a heart like that. That's self-life stuff right there. And so many Christians can be deceived in this way because they think, well, this is a noble thing. I'm doing this good thing for God. But it doesn't have nothing to do with what God wants. There's no anointing on any of that stuff. And you labour in flesh all the time. I, I, I can speak from experience. For a long time in my early years of ministry, I laboured and preached the gospel. I thought I was so faithful. <clears throat> I did it with all my might, all my energy, out of myself. <laughs> For God, whom I loved and so wanted to serve. And I still do. That hasn't changed. But... Back then, it was like ministering under a brass dome. It just, just never got anywhere. It wasn't an open heaven experience, I can tell you that. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about here. So much wasted time, so much striving, sweat, blood, tears, that God was never going to anoint or provision for an open heaven and if I dropped dead in the process in my commitment. That was the deceit of self-life ministry and self-life prayer with apparently every good intention. You know, it was just bouncing off this brassy heaven and coming straight back to me. And I knew, I knew. No anointing, no open heaven empowerment on that. Friends, learn from my failures. Learn from my mistakes. This is not about doctrine or technique here. It's nothing to do with any of that stuff. This is how it is. The Jacob, that the self-life had to be dealt with. And the Lord is still dealing with that as I walk with him each day, abiding with him, and it's withering away, withering away. Praise the Lord. And I can tell you right now, I know when I'm about to minister under a brassy dome or an open heaven, I know the difference before I even start. And when I sense that brassy dome thing, I just stop what I'm doing. I throw it all out. I get on my knees. I start all over again in prayer until there is a born again in whom there is no deceit. No Jacob, no self-life. And I can minister properly and powerfully and confidently under the anointing. This is important stuff, folks. The cross is, is healing and restoring the function of our identity as ones created in the image of God. As Holy Spirit works in us to perfect that. That work is called, as I said, sanctification. It is the purifying work of the Holy Spirit in us, piece by piece, thought by thought, attitude by attitude, motivation by motivation. Sanctification takes us from righteousness, one's forgiven and restored to relationship with God, to holiness, one's like God, and restored, to, and, and restored to proper functionality in the ministry of God. Like God in character, in, in heart, we know who we are, children of the Most High. We don't doubt the work of the cross. We stand right at the door of an open heaven, right at the door, folks. And if we are to do the things that Jesus did, and even greater things than that, as we minister to one another, to our families, to our nation, Jesus has to be able to look at us and be able to say, Behold, a child of God in whom there is no deceit, no self-life anymore. You will see heaven opened. You're going to know it. You're going to experience it. You're going to move in it. You're going to move in great anointing, great power. Behold, here is a child of God 
whose heart is being constantly purified, whose mind is constantly washed by the word, whose heart is carefully listening for my voice and so careful to heed it and not your great ideas and fantastic intentions so that you do what I authorize and not your own thing. Jesus said this, Matthew 7, 21, 22. Not everyone who acknowledges me with the words, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. We can operate under an open heaven. But only the one who actually does the will of my heavenly Father. There will be many, he says, who will say to me on that day of judgment, Lord, Lord, in your name, did we not prophesy? And in your name, did we not cast out demons? In your name, did we not perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them plainly, I have never acknowledged you. What you did was all about you. Depart from me, you doers of iniquity. <sighs> that last sentence is better translated, depart from me, you who did not do what I authorized you to do. That's exactly what it means. And now we can see right here in this word from Jesus that, that good and noble intentions are completely irrelevant compared to obedience. Obedience to Christ is about holiness. Good intentions don't contribute to holiness because they come from me. They don't come from Jesus. It all has to come from Christ in us, not Jacob, not the self-life. The point is this. We can labour for the Lord under a brass dome and get nowhere because it's all about us with the best of intentions or in an open heaven and we do the things that Jesus did and more as the self-life withers away more and more and more. That declaration of Jesus, you will see heaven opened, is the brand new destiny for the new man, for the new woman, for the child of God in Christ now and in eternity. With the coming of Holy Spirit, the open heaven is made a reality. The cross is what opens the heavens for us, but it's Holy Spirit who makes it effective in and through us. In his own baptism, his own baptism, Jesus symbolized for us death to himself, burial and resurrection. And that was when the heavens were opened to him as he came up on new, on new resurrection ground, so to speak. He had open heaven. The Spirit alighted on him, stayed with him, abiding and became the channel of communication and authority and, and revelation and wisdom, the means of supernatural anointing, the miraculous, the power and authority of heaven and communion with God. All of that from open heaven. And Jesus would later say, how many times did he say things like, I only do the son, can only do what he sees the father doing? Uh, the authorised things. Not his own well-intentioned, noble-looking Self stuff. Even out there, and he's tempted in the wilderness. He's tempted to go straight back to self life stuff. If these, uh, if you so hungry, make these stones into bread. And that's about self stuff. That's not what God wants. <coughs> Excuse me. And the open heaven over Jesus from the day of his baptism kept confirming the things that God was doing. And so it is for our baptism as well. We acknowledge the death of the self-life, uh, which is the sinful life. We're crucified, buried with Christ. We're raised with him in new life. Not the old reformatted, reformatted Jacob life. New life. If anyone is in Christ, they are a whole new creation. Or actually, the text means a whole new species, never, never existing yet. <laughs> the old's gone, the new has come. Why? Only the new life can operate fully and for the glory of God under an open heaven. The self-life just can't do it. We're in, in an era, folks, of Holy Spirit, starting with Pentecost. 
who helps us deal with any self-life that still wants to persist. And we put it to death by the ministry of the Holy Spirit who applies the work of the cross. And I talk, read, read about it in Romans 8.13. The hallmark, the hallmark of a life so anointed by Holy Spirit as to be able to powerfully operate under an open heaven is that you know Christ in this living and ever-growing, rich, beautiful way. So that you only do, you know his heart, you only do what you see him doing. This open heaven thing, it's not for a select few. It is, it's not for some elite. Uh, there's no such thing in God. God is no respecter of persons. It's for every child of God who knows who they are, who God has called to be holy because he is holy. Holy speaks to holy. And, and we're therefore committed to a disciplined life of obedience so that Jacob, so that the self-life continues to wither and wither and wither and wither and never gets a say in anything else ever again. The, these messages, these last few weeks about an open heaven are very, very serious prophetic challenges and encouragement for our churches today in these difficult times. God's moving in this very moment, folks. I know it, I feel it, others feel it. His kingdom is advancing. He's calling upon his church to rise up and powerfully minister under the heaven open for us to undo the works of the enemy that bind people, that bind our planet in so many ways. We know who we are in the image of God. <clears throat> our salvation is restoring the glory and therefore the functionality of our identity every day as we deal with self-life stuff with the help of Holy Spirit applying the work of the cross. And the cross has dealt the self-life a, a death blow. But so many Christians keep breathing life back into that thing with the way they live. And now we, we're to learn Christ. We learn him. Learn his heart as we abide with him. Uh, and we learn what he prefers, what he loves, what he wants, what he would like to do. And we do as he commands us and, and, and never offer him, in place of all that, our good intentions, which are so, so inferior. It's about obedience, friends. The time for minimalist thinking about your salvation is over. We're not kids anymore. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are in a new season, folks. We're going to see signs and wonders and a great advance of the gospel. I totally believe that. It's coming. And I want to operate as best I possibly can while I've got breath in my body under an open heaven to do the things that Jesus did and even greater things for the glory of the Father. And so this morning I want to ask one question. Who wants in? Who wants in on that? I'm in. <laughs> and if you want in, I'm serious now. If you want in, it's time to do to deal the self-life, a withering blow once and for all that breaks it. To stop messing with sin and your best intentions and feed those up to Jesus as if it was his command when it's not. They're no substitute for the obedience to Jesus Christ, not at all. And so, folks, it's time to get serious in this season. Can I encourage you, wherever you are right now, just to bow your heads humbly before the Lord, bow your heart towards him right now, and let's pray. Time to get serious. Folks, it's time to get ruthless with this self-life that keeps interfering with your ability as a child of God to access open heaven. It's time to get serious about learning Christ, learning what his heart wants, learning who he is, not about him, who he is to you. It's time to glorify the Father and honour the salvation he has given us to steward that properly. And so today I ask this other question. Do you need breakthrough today? Do you need God to strike a withering blow to the self-life once and for all? Then you've got to ask for that. You've got to go with that. And you've got to want that. You've got to wrestle with him like Jacob did and not let go until that is broken and the withering starts. Father, break the self-life in me today. I 
desperately want that gone. I want any interference with my ability, my capacity to be a child of God, operating under an open heaven. I want that dealt a death blow, Lord, today, that it be broken and goes into withering, uh, a withering thing until it is gone. And Lord, I help me by your spirit to never go back to breathing, resuscitating that self-life. What an offence to the cross that would be. Lord, I don't want to do that anymore. And I want to operate not under a brassy dome anymore, but under an open heaven, that you, Lord, may be glorified, that everyone who knows me will know that it's God at work in me, not my best intentions, not my great creativity, not my innovation, not my skill, not my capacity, but you, Lord God, in me, that you may be glorified and men would be caused to give praise to you. Amen. May God bless you. Take these messages to heart. If you want the series of messages, I'll send them to you. But if you've missed out on them, I encourage you, I implore you, get a hold of them, listen to them, and do what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do. The time is short. God is on the march, and I want to be part of that. I want our churches to be part of that as well. May God bless you until we meet again.
joining us. We pray that you are blessed and encouraged from today's online service. For more information, please visit us online.